north of D-Day. Following the bloody carnage of the landings, the Allied invasion force found itself penned in against the Normandy coastline. It was up to the reconnaissance corps, the eyes and ears of the invasion force, to find a way through. On the 31st of July, a dingo driven by trooper G.B. Bland left on a risky recce mission. What can you see, Pearson? The diminutive dingo was great for sneaking along narrow tracks and hiding in cover. But as trooper Bland headed into hostile territory, there was a very real risk of contact with the enemy. So as well as stealth, he needed firepower too. The Dingo was equipped with a brand light machine gun like this one. A British version of a Czech original. The British Bren gun was perfect for the recce corps because it was light, simple to use and proved very reliable. And it could unleash 120 rounds a minute with deadly accuracy. A skirmish with infantry was one thing, but the lightly armored Dingo had to pick its fights. Do I see panzers before me, Pearson? Yes, definitely panzers, Pearson. Time to employ the secret weapon. Select first, engage, throw it in reverse. Pre-select third. And this time, 60 miles an hour, backwards. And we're going as fast backwards as we were forwards. Absolutely fantastic. All five gears in reverse. It's thanks to the same pre-selector gearbox as the luxury DB-17 I was driving earlier. Which means, as the troops said at the time, you can get out of trouble faster than you got into it. In his hunt for a route out of Normandy, Trooper Bland was now deep behind enemy lines. Hello, sir. Yes, enemy infantry spotted at crossroads one mile west-northwest of our position, sir. He had found an intact and lightly guarded bridge. Secure that bridge, Bland. Very good, sir. On our way, sir. Moving out, Pearson. Trooper Bland and his dingo secured the bridge, the Allies' escape path from Normandy. The dingo, a brilliantly improvised machine, rushed into production on the eve of war, was the mechanical hero of the hour. And the march to Berlin could begin. Well done, men. God save the king. The end was in sight. With grit, valor, ingenuity and inventiveness, the Allies had achieved the impossible. We turned the tide of war. But there was one great invention of the 1940s that took much longer to develop. It played only a minor role in the war, but it went on to change the world like no other machine of the decade. Even though it was based on an idea that at first must have sounded completely crazy. An engine that pushed you along using its own exhaust fumes. And it was made possible in no small measure by the humble knife and fork. Surely only a fool could imagine such a thing replacing the mighty piston engine? So, when a young RAF test pilot told the British government that beauties like this 1800 horsepower Bristol Hercules had reached the end of the line and that development money should be poured into his gas turbine engine, the government said in that way that governments so often do... Uh, no. That test pilot was Frank Whittle. In 1930, aged just 23, he patented the gas turbine or jet engine. It was designed to produce incredibly high pressure exhaust with just one main moving part, the rotor. But to generate sufficient exhaust thrust to power an aircraft, the rotor had to spin at 16,000 revs per minute, enduring temperatures of 500 degrees Celsius. No chance with traditional materials, but Whittle believed he had just the material for the job, a newly developed relative of Stabrite cutlery steel. In 1939, just in time, the next generation of this came along, Rex 78, which could handle temperatures 100 degrees higher than any stainless steel around. Most top government advisers remained unconvinced. But Whittle did have supporters, including Hugh Dowding of Fighter Command, who was quite literally bowled over by Whittle's progress. 
During a test run, unable to be heard over the racket, Whittle pointed out the jet nozzle to Dowding as if to say, that's the business end. Oblivious, Dowding walked straight into the blast and was instantly hurled across the floor. Point made, I think. In May 1941, Whittle's perseverance was finally rewarded as Britain's first jet aircraft took to the air, the Gloucester Pioneer, which three years later evolved into the first jet fighter. And this is it, the wonderful Gloucester Meteor, a 500 mile an hour jet fighter. Its two Rolls-Royce jet engines were developed from Whittle's original designs and each produced over three and a half thousand pounds of thrust. Unfortunately, no two-seater models were built. So pilots couldn't actually be trained to fly this revolutionary aircraft. All the pilot got was this, pilot's notes. Hmm, the trimming controls are spongy in operation, and accurate trimming therefore demands great patience. Just what you want to know when you're hurtling towards the ground at over 400 miles an hour. As they got to grips with their meteors, these brave pilots pioneered the jet age. A whole new world of extreme speeds and G-forces, in which everything happens so much faster.